All right, let's um, open to Mark 11. I want to share this evening on the role of our tongue in our lives, our Christian work, and even in our spiritual work. Mark 11, 22 to 24, says, Have uh, Jesus answering, uh, saith unto them, Have faith in God. So, put your trust in God. Have your faith in God. And then what was the next statement that he made? He said, for verily I say unto you. So, a person who has faith in God says, this is how that person's faith in God for something is going to be demonstrated. He says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe what? Believe that those things which he saith, and the word saith is in present continuous tense. These things which he is saying shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he is saying. So what this means is nobody can knowledgeably be putting their trust in God for something and with their words, all right, speak in a contrary way. In other words, it will be reflected first and foremost in what they are saying. Now, many people will say, well, I put my trust in God for something. Well, if you just listen to them for five minutes, you will know that they are, they, it's out of ignorance. All right, they are not putting their trust in God for it. For the Bible tells us, if a man bridled or bridles not his tongue, all right, it says, a man, if a man seemeth to be religious among you, and doesn't bridle his tongue, or bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, that person's religion, in other words, their piety, their quote-unquote relationship with God, is empty. So he says this, and the person is self-deluded. In other words, yes, they're under some delusion. Nothing is going to happen. It will not be productive. The tongue is the first place to go to. So he says, have faith in God, right? If you have faith in God for something, then there'll be some verbal communication between you and your objective, that's this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and not doubt in your heart, but believe in what? Believing that what you are saying will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Then he says in verse 23, Therefore I say unto you. Now this therefore means this is there for this. You can't work in verse 24 without obeying the principle of 23. Because the only things you can have are the things that you are saying. That God told Moses, tell them as long as I live in numbers, whatsoever I hear them say, that is what I'm going to do. So Jesus said, therefore I say unto you, what are the things you desire? You should have aligned your words with that. It says, when you pray, believe that through prayer, you are actually going to receive, all right, the things that you have been saying. This is what he's saying, yeah? And it says, you shall have them. Right? Then it says, the one hindrance to it is verse 25, 
where he says, and when you stand praying about it, I will explain this on Sunday, when you receive it, you know that I've got a mistake. It says you will never have that experience in prayer if you have ought against anybody in your heart, you will never come to the point where you know that you have gotten it. It says, if you have ought against any, that your father who is in heaven might also forgive you, all right, of your trespasses. So I look at the role of the tongue here in our lives. See how important it is and it's pivotal there that a person cannot say that I'm putting faith in God for something. And they are with their words, they are contradicting it. It's just that is in faith. In fact, and I'll start by, by telling this story here. Uh, Kenneth Hagin, of blessed memory, went to pray for a young man whom he was called to come and pray for at the Oral Roberts University Faith Clinic. And so he was praying in the spirit, waiting to lay hands on the man. And while he prayed in the spirit, because as you pray in the spirit, you get to a place of listening prayer. Remember, we saw on Sunday in Isaiah 28 verse 11, it says, with stammering lips and with an unknown tongue, will he speak to these people. So when you are praying in the spirit, actually you are speaking mysteries to God, but God also wants to communicate certain things to you. So you get to a place of quietness in your heart, and then you can start getting the thoughts of God. A, a word is an uttered thought. So you communicate his thoughts concerning it. So as I was praying in the Spirit, I said, I heard these words. Words have been spoken. Spiritual laws have been set into motion, which at this time cannot be reversed. This man's spirit is better off with me in heaven. Release him and let him go. He said he ignored it and continued praying in the spirit. And then he came back after some time. Words have been spoken. Spiritual laws have been set into motion. In other words, with words, you set spiritual laws into motion. Now, you can say them persistently to a point where only if that person reverses it by themselves can the effect be reversed. But because the guy was unconscious, it was words have been spoken, spiritual laws have been set into motion, which at this time cannot be reversed. This one's spirit is better off with me in heaven. Release him and let him go. So, can I think he went in, laid hands on the man, young man, and said, I release him. Shortly after that, the man died. It said when he was, went to do the funeral service, and he didn't tell anybody, because people that hear from heaven don't spout around the whole place I heard from heaven. Or else you get into serious trouble. Are uh, you following what I'm saying here? Okay, you don't go and say, I heard from heaven, I heard from heaven, I heard from heaven. Right? You obey what you have heard and see whether it is heaven that said to you. <laughs> All right? So he kept it to himself. And, and this is interesting when you know you've heard. He kept it. Because Satan could still be playing on your mind whether you really heard God or it was just something that happened. You touched him and died. Maybe the man was going to die before. So are you sure it is, it is you heard anything? He said, his younger brother said, you know, something interesting um, happened here. And Ken Fagan said, what? He said, for one reason or another, my brother always used to say, he thinks he will be dead before he's 40. And he'll be 40 next week. So Ken Fagan understood what, what just happened. That words had been spoken, spiritual laws have been set into motion, which at this time cannot be reversed by you. Only the person who said he can reverse and was already unconscious. All right? Release him and let him go. Now, that's how powerful words are. You can speak words continuously over a period of time where you set spiritual laws into motion that there is nothing that can reverse it. The outcomes in your life cannot be reversed, particularly once you've gone up to God in prayer and you have received those things from God and you have entered into the spiritual substance of those things, it cannot be reversed. In fact, it becomes almost transgenerational if Jesus or right tarries. Now, what do we do in prayer? We've got to understand this. We said this on Sunday, and Jesus said, he said, when you pray, believe that through prayer, you will receive it. So, 
I have this picture here. So when Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to pray, what they meant was, I am going to God to receive this particular thing. And when I have received it from God, I will come back to come and meet you. Now, once I have received it from him, then when I speak out of my lips, those things have to materialize, right? Because I have received the spiritual substance on the inside. That's God has granted these things, I've received them. Now, he gave them in Christ Jesus, but at that point, I have received them. So, it's a picture of the person that goes into prayer and says, I will come out of prayer, all right? Now, he may have to come out because he has, he has to go to the office, all right? And so, must leave prayer by 6.30 a.m., but he doesn't leave prayer until he gets it, which means the next day he goes again and presses deeper into the spirit until he comes to a point where they get that particular thing. And once they've gotten it, it has registered inside their heart. You know, I won't share the testimony because I don't want people to, to use it wrongly because it's this kind of testimonies we shared before that people became lazy, okay? Because sometimes you don't know what exactly happened. And when you share the testimony, then people will now say, it's just like people that will say that I didn't read for it because I went to pray. I don't, and then people, so you don't want people, you know, all these testimonies, people start saying, can God do it? Can God do it? Can God, God can do it now. God can do it now. I don't have to walk. I don't have to do it. Then we, a confusion came in. So I won't say what happened, but I will say the testimony. And this young man wrote me, said in 2019, he said, what you preached on Sunday, he said, is correct. He said, I have experienced it myself. He said, I ran into a particular situation, and then I went back home. And when I got home, he said, my father, and this is upbringing. You know, people joke about things, but these things are powerful. He said, my father was a CAC man. We grew up in CAC. So he had an altar, what we used to call the family altar, which was a place that would go in the house and was dedicated solely to prayer. He said, so I went there and I started praying. He said, I started praying and praying and praying. He said, one morning I got up. And as I was about to pray, it was like the thing entered into me. And I knew that I'd gotten that thing. He said, I just knew on the inside. He said, shortly after, all right, I got a message and went to check that particular thing. And it was exactly as I received it inside my heart. He said, I moved from a place of anxiety concerning it. And I entered into that rest of God. So this is something you go. Jesus went the first time. He didn't get it. All right, he went back to meet his disciples. Uh, said, won't you tarry with me? Went again, prayed again. He didn't get it the second time. Went to meet his disciples, won't tarry. Then went a third time and pressed. And the Bible says at that particular point, he got it and came back and said, you guys, you can't sleep on now, which means we have gotten that particular thing. So the picture of a person who goes into prayer is the picture of a person who drives his friend or brother, sister to the bank. And says, I have this check I'm going to cash. Stay inside the car. That's the picture with Jesus and his disciples. When I go into the bank, and I, next time you see me coming out of the bank, it means that I have converted the check into cash. And I'm coming out with cash. All right? So when you go in a prayer there, the check that you want to convert to substance, hear what I'm saying, are the words you have been speaking. In other words, what you are saying is, I want to go and cash my confession. You hear what I said? Now, if your confessions have been contradicting God's word, you have a blank check. I'll show you from scripture. That's why there is no chance under heaven, except through the intercession, intercession of somebody else. That somebody who has been speaking anyhow can enter into the place of prayer, all right, and go on. And you see, if a person has been particularly been making certain confessions and declaring it, when they get into certain situations within their lives, they just say, look, it's now time to cash, all right, this check that I have, all right, been. So prayer is intentional and it is result-oriented. That's well, it's a, it is, is, for want of words, it's like a science. See, there was a man back then in, back then in 1920s, of, well, maybe I'm 1930s, 40s, and he, the, the, 
what you call the Africans in South Africa had gone into a war with the British, and the British won. So British were now in charge of South Africa, and they dealt with them. So those guys, and the Africans were like Dutch, German uh, people that used to farm. So the man said he went in and started praying. He, was in a, he went from wealth to poverty. He started praying. He said he would go into the woods and he would pray. He said after pressing deep into God, he said he came out one day and God told him and gave him a prophecy. He said a minister shall come from the United States of America and he shall come into this country. This was almost like 12 months before the man came. On March so so and so at 1 p.m. He will be lodging in so so and so's house. All right, go there and give him these words that I've said. And his ministry shall be for the restoration of many things that you have lost and your people have lost. He said on that set date, there was no phone, nothing back then. He went to the house and asked for the woman, is there so-so and so woman that lives there? He said, that's a house. He went in and said, you must have a guest that came from America. He said, yes, the missionary just came an hour ago. He went in there. John Chile Grossi said, the man led every, look, you can press into God and get things. Prayer is not that, you know, and this is the mistake people make when they were saying prayer of faith. I, I knew there was something wrong. When they were saying prayer of faith, they would say, all right, we just pray it once. So I, I said, look, what are you saying? You may not just say something. Father, I believe I receive my healing now in Jesus' name. Now, don't pray about it again. Don't pray about it again. You are in faith. Don't pray about it again. Don't pray about it. You should be saying, don't pray about it again. I'm not praying about it again. Now, the act of faith is, I'm not praying about it again. I'm not praying about it again. Yeah, but I'm not praying about it again. Yeah. Say, yeah. So I say, yeah, yeah. Uh, I heard, but you see, when they said prayer of faith, the term prayer of faith was used to describe the prayer of Elijah. Now, he prayed once, but when we say once, he persisted until he got it. Well, he knew on the inside, not that the rain started falling. He knew to a point where he said, I have this particular time. So he came out, and it would have been to disrespect God. If you go and meet somebody and say, can you give me 50,000? He says, here's the 50,000. You can't ask him again for the 50,000 naira now. If he gives you the thing, you can't ask again. So once you have gotten it on the inside there, you know, you yourself will know that I have this particular thing. You see, I've been confessing it, but now there is a deposit that is on the inside of me. The same way if you ask you, how do you know you are born again? It's just know on the inside that you are born again. Isn't that how you know? That prayer that is answered, you will know that same way. There will be a witness on the inside of you. Nobody can meet you and say you're not born again. You know you're born again. All right? It's, there's a witness. Even if your body acts like you're not born again, there's a witness on the inside that you're born again. So what happens is, it's a witness on the inside of yourself that you know within yourself that, listen, I have gotten this particular thing. All right? And so after that point, when Elijah, so after Elijah came out, Elijah came out and said, all right, very clearly, he said, tell Ahab, tell him to get on his horse, horses there. He had told him about this, I heard the sound of abundance of rain. But now he said, the rain is about to do what? Fall. In other words, we have gotten it. So prayer is not, that's why Jesus said when you pray, enter into your closet and shut the door. He is not talking about a physical door. He's saying, enter into a place in your heart and shut it. And in that place there, you are communing with God, which means you shut everything out. You are communing with God. And he says, your father that sees you in secret will reward you openly then. So we can be praying publicly together while some people are outside their door and some people are inside there. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, it's not possible to arrive, all right, at the place where you will know on the inside. I've gotten it if your confessions contradict. It's just not possible. The Bible, that's why the Bible says, any man who is double-minded or wavers, let not that man, all right, think that he will receive anything from God. It's just not. And it means that their confession there, they have a dual confession, which means it goes with the wind and all of that. They just won't be able to receive things of God. So we have many people that are fasting and praying, and there is no chance under the sun that they're going to get any results. The reason is that they have unforgiveness in their hearts towards people there, that they are unwilling to receive. Even when they are praying and the Holy Ghost witnesses that there's something they refuse to do. They just will not let go of it. it. Look, I'm telling you, impossible. Because the space where that unforgiveness is, right, is the space where you receive the promise. 
It's like, this is the house. You want to park a car there. You put rubbish in the car. The person brings the car. There's rubbish there. I can't park the car. All right? So it becomes, all right, impossible, right, to be able to change that. All right. So when we pray, we are going to cash a check, all right, that we have written with our words. And so God has given us promises, and what we are to do is to start confessing these promises. Now, and this is how you write the check, because Psalm 45 and verse 1 tells us your tongue, all right, is the pen of a ready writer. So God, all right, is writing out things in your own life. He is the writer, your tongue is his pen. So when he gets hold of your tongue, he is able to write certain things. So when he says, I will write my laws in their minds, and in their inward thoughts will I put it, it's your tongue he uses to write that. That's why the Bible says, the ships, though they be so great, and are driven by fierce winds, are turned about whithersoever the governor listed. That's the Lord, the captain listed. He says, even so, the tongue. So the captain of your life, Jesus, must have control of your tongue or he doesn't have control over the outcomes in your life. He doesn't have control over the outcome. If you are saying the wrong things, he doesn't have control over the outcomes within your life. He doesn't. That's why it says death and life. That's a categorical statement. Are uh, in the power of the tongue. And they that love it or are making use of it are eating of its fruit thereof. And everybody's making use of it every day. So you are eating the fruit of the things, which means the words you speak are seeds that you sow. The effect of those words are the fruits that you eat every single day. So we get into a place of prayer to receive what we've been praying about. All right. To re sorry. We get into the place of prayer where we receive what we are praying about. All right. And we get it. And so it's like cashing a check, all right, from the bank. That's why the scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed from the hands of the enemy. Because when he says it, God is able to write that. So when the time comes where there is an oppressor in the office or an oppressor somewhere and they go to God in prayer concerning it because they have been saying it, they are redeemed. That manifestation occurs in the life of that person. While if you have not been saying it, then you don't reap the benefits of what Jesus Christ has done for you. All right? So why must we declare God's word? All right? So that, because it's only what is spoken by you that can be cashed by you in prayer. In other words, it's only the checks that are signed there that can be cashed in prayer. So, for example, the Bible tells us life is in cycles and there are seasons. And there will always be seasons, all right, that go on in life. It's, that's just the way the life is. Now, so there will be, like Paul said, he said, I know how to abound and I know how to be abased. There will be seasons there. Now, uh, and let me just say this here. This is why you should, and it's important, you cannot afford to be a spender as a human being or else you will end up in poverty. Because let me say this here now, all right? You must always have money in reserve. And therefore, you must. Because there will be opportunities that will come that if you don't have money in reserve there, what will happen is you will miss those opportunities. That's why there are five virgins and five wise and foolish. You get what I'm saying here? One day having reserve, the door was closed. The place where I want to build a convention center, the man just called me from the blues one day. It was January 2nd. He said, we are selling land. It's on sale. I, in my life, I'd never heard they said there's a land is on sale. He said it's on sale. Do you want to buy? And what had happened to me was that, listen, and I mean, you just have to admit it and, and just cut your losses and learn your lesson. Because let me say this to you. Life is in cycles. The seasons will always come back. So if you made a mistake in a season, don't blame anybody. Just know that next time this season comes, you will see. You will know who is who. That I will, I will maximize it. 
Because the same man had called me. We are just here having church in this place. All right? That's what we are doing. Just doing church here. And he called me once and said, I hear that you've been missing a lot of people that are coming to your church now. And he was, I think he was a billionaire there. He said, a lot of people that come to your church now and all of that. He said, I mean, he was the father of tech in Nigeria. That's he was the real beginner of the unfair tech. Everyone of the people said, there's land in Lekki. I mean, to me, we are here. You say land in Lekki, all of us. I just told him, I said, I'm not interested. So when we now moved to Lekki, I realized that God knew years before. You know, I never knew the land until he called me for this other one. This time. I knew I had nothing to do with that land. I just said, let's go. <laughs> because I had learned that. Are you following me here? Let's go and buy it. When we finish buying it, we'll find out what we'll do. <laughs> Chebi, if God didn't send us, we will do what? Sell it. So I asked somebody in church who had, I, I said, they, they want to buy because I knew it was being put out there. He said, ah, that land, I said, it's good. He said, he said, just solidify it, fence it in one year the value doubles. So I knew that even if I miss God, I, I will recoup. <laughs> I will recoup investment. Uh, even if we miss God on this one, we did miss investment. All right? So let me tell you what he did. So he picked me in his car to take me to the land. He now turned to me. He said, I've wanted to sell land to you before. I said, yes. He said, it was the land of British International. I said, that that whole place where you visited, that, that whole place we filled would have been covenant land. You just keep quiet <laughs> and tell yourself, God, forgive me. <laughs> but another season is coming. No, no, no. You know it's coming. I look at Ecclesiastes 1 4. I believe it's Ecclesiastes 1 4. Put, let me just show you here. Seasons come and go. All right? Ecclesiastes. It says, one generation passes away, another generation cometh. But the earth, what? Abideth forever. Next verse. The sun ariseth and goeth down, and hasteth to the place where he was arose. Look at the next one. The wind goeth towards the south. Turneth, it's all be turning about. If they don't get anything, it's coming back to where it started. Turneth about the whole north. Whereas about continually, the wind returneth again according to his what? Circuit. Look at the next one. The all rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they do what? Returning. Listen, life is in what? Cycles. If you miss it once, just, just perch. It will come back. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Don't start fronting. It's not my fault. It's your fault. Just <laughs> perch. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's opportunity. It's your fault. Uh, I didn't have the point. Didn't the Bible say? Learn the lesson. They that observe the wind will not. They that regards the cloud will not. So we had money in hand. See, first start center. I, we had no intention of moving in there. Someone just came and said, Pastor, it's available. Though. That place is available. They just said they want to sell it. This is the amount. They want cash now. If you don't have cash, it's gone. Listen, when we bought it, as we bought it, if I tell you the people that came to the land, if I call their name, you will know they came with capacity, but it was gone. Opportunities open and close. Another of our centers now, the opportunity came. The man, this is plug and play now. When I say plug and play, the man that owns the thing was a, 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 was a pastor. He built a church, built Offices, build children's church. After some time, the man died. He told his family it must be sold or given to a church. So we found the place. They said, this is the amount. Are, are you following what I'm saying? It will open and do what? If you don't have cash in hand. Do you understand what I'm saying here? So if you are driving a BMW, it's because you could have bought a Bentley. If your money is BMW money, you should be driving Toyota Corolla. <laughs> so that you have cash. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have cash in hand to do what? To move. Or else you miss opportunity. Yes. 
That's what they were saying about the farming time. That God is not, is not some deep, not some deep mystery. When there was abundance, God told Joseph, have cash in hand. The season will do what? Change. The man that said, I want to sell land on sale. Season change. There was what? Pressure. They are releasing it at a cheaper price. Well, if you, if I, made, I made two million. You, they see you somewhere. You talk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, on Instagram, we have come. Soft life. You saw this of life. All right, so Psalm, I just want to say that, Psalm 33, verse 18. Now, there might be, this is the point I'm getting to. So there'll be a season of abundance. There might be times where there's famine in the land. But this should have been the confession of a Christian continuously. Psalm 33, 18, here, Psalm 30. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him and upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Now, if you have been confessing that and famine comes, you go and cash your check. Do you get what I'm saying? Let me show you a deeper one. Psalm 33, verse 19. It's not that you two will now join them. Can you see? There's famine in the land. Hey, bread. Who? Are you following what I'm saying here? Yes, you know. This is Satan that is going around. I'll show you. Looking for who may devour. He's looking for who is saying the wrong thing. Put this that scripture there. Look at this one. It says, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be what? Satisfied. Not that they will, make, they, will, they will survive. They shall be what? Satisfied. It should be your confession. Because it will be in cycles. Anywhere you go, there's, there is from Jackpot to, in fact, uh, Jackpot there, you will meet what after some time? Famine. Are you following this? So until words spoken, until words are spoken by an individual, all right, certain things cannot happen even if God intends. So you have to start saying those things. Now, let me just show you two things here. When a Satan wants to attack a person, okay, when Anything wants to go, look, for you to be able to get a person, you have to get that person to say things. If they don't say things, you have no point of entry into their life. Even God, when he wants to judge a person, he has to wait for that person to talk. That's why when he wanted to catch David, he sent the prophet. I'll show you. The prophet said, if somebody behaves like this, what should we do? David said, that man should not say, he said, it is you. Oh, yeah. Because the law is by your words, you'll be justified. By your own words, you'll be what? Condemned. That's why when somebody's going through something, don't, don't go there and say, they are finished, they are finished. By you, what you are saying is if I'll enter into that place, I'll be finished. See what happened. Look at Mark chapter 12, verse 13. In fact, the next series I'm going to do is, 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 on, is, on, is on the, the law of the tongue. Mark 12, verse 13. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to do what? Catch him in his words. They said, look, we can't catch him if he doesn't say certain things. So they started provoking Jesus so he could say something. Then when he, that's, that's why you have to understand it's called the Miranda Rite. It's spiritual. They got it from the Bible. When they are, it's not here, when they arrest the person, they will say, you reserve the right to remain silent. And not to say anything until your lawyer shows up. 
For anything you say shall be used against you. Uh, it's a law in the spirit. You reserve the right to what? Remain what? Silent. Look at Luke chapter 11 verse 54. You know, Satan is called the accuser of the day. How does he do it? Laying in wait and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might do what? Accuse him. So the accuser of the brethren, when a person goes to pray, he goes to God. God, we can't get this thing. Why? Look at what this person has done. And the law is, the, we will see the law. You can't, they can't, a person can't get it. So we've seen the example here of David. Let's just quickly look at it. 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 10. Quickly. 2 Samuel 1 to 10 here. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. And you see that a person must talk. And he came to him and said, there were two men in one city. One was rich, the other was what? Poor. The rich man had exceeded many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished up. And he grew up together with him, uh, with his children. He, he did eat of his own meat, drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and spared to, spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd, to dress for the welfare of man that was come unto him. But took, that instead of taking from his own abundance, he, to, to help the man, he took of the poor man's lamb, dressed it, all right, for the man that was to come to him. And David's anger. He didn't know he was king. Many people are angry at themselves. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And he said, listen to me, this rich people, this rich people is them. If money touches them. <laughs> See, David's anger was greatly kindled. That's why when people say, uh, somebody had private jets. There's more you can do with private jets money. Okay, your own car. Park it now. <laughs> I mean, you don't know what God is looking at. Park your car. Uh, okay, park it. Sell the car now and be entering BRT. What's your problem? Life is in levels. Why are you complaining? I, can you sell that car? People, pe people will get food from, 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 from you selling that car. If you're selling at $3 million, just go out and go and buy bread. People, people will be rejoicing. Then when it finishes, then you understand life because you will see the same people that you thought you helped. Say, look at this useless man. He sold, he sold this car to come, and, to come and feed us all one day. Useless man. Look, at village people are following, then you will know that. Now, let's put this. Uh, okay. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said unto Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. If God was not a God of mercy. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan told him, said to him, Thou art the man. Thus said the Lord God of Israel, and I anointed thee king, because it's by your words. Are you following what I'm saying? Let me give another example. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. It is a law. It says, 12, 37, for by thy words thou shalt be what? Justified. And by thy words thou shalt be what? Condemned. Luke chapter 6, verse 37 and verse 38. It says, judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall, all right, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Look at what he says there. Next verse. He says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Praise down, shake it together, and run over. Shall men give to your bosom? For with the measure you meet, it shall be measured back. I hope you know what God is saying here. He's not saying if you, he's not talking about himself. He said, 
if you don't forgive other people for the wrong they do unto you, people will not forgive you for the wrong you do. So many times, let me tell you this. When people wrong you and God is pushing, forgive, he knows there's something coming. So that he can have the legal ground to deliver you on the earth because you have planted a seed there. So I can't forgive that. I say, they, they will catch you. Then you make one mistake. They just say, we are firing this person. Somebody else made the same mistake. They are canceling the person. <laughs> say, look, come here. You just need to mentor this person. They say, continue. You are real talented. Somebody else said, what are you saying? Tell him to get out now. You say, what's it? It's the same measure you made is measured back. You judge, people will judge you. You condemn, people will do what? Condemn you. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. So Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. If I bring this to close, he says, And when he saw the dream, they said, This matter is by the decree of the watcher that he is finished. And by the demand, all right, and the demand by the word. So everything is by words. And words are weapons. That's why. This is why if people start saying things, they, it is, they, are, they are releasing weapons. Are you following what I'm saying here? If there's a chatter over your life, go and play with it. Don't leave it open. That's warfare is intense. Is it, that's going to end time to prayer. Uh, do you get what I'm saying here? If people start to gossip about you, whether it's true or wrong, don't be saying, eh, they are, listen, end time to prayer. Because no weapon formed or fashioned against your prosper, and every tongue. The weapons, spiritual weapons are what? And sometimes when you are praying and you have difficulty in the place of prayer, is that the Holy Ghost is dealing with some people's words they spoke somewhere. Are you following? Now, let's just go on. All right? To the intent that living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he wills and setteth over it the basis of men. Verse 24. Let's go here. So what was the interpretation for the verse? And this is interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the most high which is come upon the Lord King. That they shall drive thee from men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field that they shall make to eat oxen. And he says you'll be there for seven years. Now, so he asked them, what's the solution? Verse 27. Daniel now told them solution in verse 27. Wherefore, king, let my counsel be acceptable. That they have decreed they want to destroy you. But let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Break off your sins by righteousness and their iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. For it, if it may be a lengthening of thy what? Tranquility. Oh, that's peace around. Verse 28. He says, and all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. What verse, verse 29? Nebuchadnezzar in everything was peaceful. Maybe you forgot. At the end of 12 months, one year after, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spoke and said, this is what they call village people, said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power, for my honor and my word, majesty. Look at the next verse. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice fell from what? Heaven. If he never said those words, the judgment will never have hit him. Please let me advise you. If you are in any organization, anywhere, the group of people, don't ever open your mouth and say, I'm the one who is responsible for the progress of everything here. If they fire you, if they hear and they fire you, you will learn life. Because that organization will continue expanding and growing without you. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then you have to wait for the next season, which may be good. If you get angry, you're angry, you are bitter, then you won't see that season again because then you've left the cycle. But you wait that God, I open my mouth, I shouldn't have. Next time, 
Are you following what I'm saying? So, no matter, listen, no matter how gifted you are, it might, it might look like it's your, it might, my, it's my intelligence, but you just find out, the organization will be going on without you. Are you following what I'm saying? If you are anything, go and thank God. God, I thank, because you don't know the ecosystem, who is contributing what. There was a chap, a man, he was a pastor. His church was doing well everything. He said somebody died. He didn't even know. The guy used to be, what's the American? He used to be the head of the like, labor union in their state. He said he didn't even know anything. They buried or anything. He said the whole church just stagnated. He said one day he was praying. He realized that when he gets visions and revelations from God about the church, he would discuss it with the guy. That it was that guy that was interpreting everything. He said, he said he realized. So sometimes there may be people around that are causing things to happen that are quiet. And let me tell you, in an organizational matter, the loudest person is the easiest to get rid of. Anybody that is saying, we have come. No. Anybody that says, we have come, is fine. Anybody that says, I have come, is the problem. You get what I'm saying? Luke chapter 11, 53, that's why it says that for every I do what you spoke, we speak, you have which is just come out and you just talk. Now, having said that, therefore you should understand this. Psalm 39, verse 1, you should know this. All right? You should know that practice Psalm 39, verse 1. I said I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is what? Before me. So look, if there is intense provocation that is going around, lock your mouth. It is never as bad as it looks. It is your own mouth that will contribute trouble to it. Because that's what it means. The, your enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What he's waiting for is who will say the wrong thing. Like now, there's economic downturn. He said, we have died, we have died. It's those people. It's God. You know, I was telling my wife this after I said this evening. This church, at least from Jack by rumors, I've lost, lost now. We sold that seed, but I'm saying lost. At least a thousand people. You can't see it reflected anywhere. But that says, listen, let me tell you. Let me tell you. All you people that are Jaguar, God is not with you. I'm just telling you. See, Oga, they've caught you. Because the people that are Jaguar will do what? Say what you want to say. <laughs> are you from Even your brother, as you are saying it, <laughs> will leave you and go. Say, Oga. One went, another one remained. I'm going. <laughs> Are you following? Psalm 141, verse 3 and verse 4. Psalm 141. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, and keep the watch door of my lips. Because that's how they enter. Next verse. Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that walk iniquity. Let me not do what? Eat of their word dainties. That will speak the words they are speaking. Look, if you want to have a different life, you can't say what everybody is saying. Finally, 1 Peter 5, 8. So we understand this scripture very well now. It says, be sober and what? Vigilant. Because you are adversary the devil. Like a what? Roaring lion. Look, if he, if, if he could devour anybody, he should he just devour now. Why is he seeking? That means he can't just devour people. And why are you seeking now? Do you get what I'm saying? If it was that powerful, he would just carry anybody now. But he's seeking whom? Hold up there. What kind about seeking whom he may do what? Devour. Which means certain conditions must be fulfilled in that person's life for him to be able to launch the attack. 
Look at what he says next. He says, he says, whom resist steadfast in your what? Faith. You are speaking faith freely words. You can't do anything. But he's going around. Where he hears that sound, we are finished. He said, come to this one. Are you following me? Why he goes around and says, say, listen to me. Listen to me. You know, if you have a Nigerian passport, they will refuse to give you visa. Come to that one. They will never get visa. As they're going there, bam. Because you did what? You said it. Another person says, this is my passport. Shall take me into the nations of the earth. When they get to those places, they'll be asking me. Uh, you get what I say? I mean, I got to one place. One country. Uh, and the plane came from somewhere else to the country. So it wasn't like I was coming from Nigeria. So the guy looked at me and said, oh, Nigeria. He says, so how was the match? I looked at her and said, which match? It was the one that uh, they beat us. So, they <laughs> so I, didn't, I, I said, which match? He said, just this match. When I, he started laughing. You know, he even forgot to take my fingerprints. He said, take your passport. But, but we were both laughing. Like, so, so. It was when I got to hotel. Monima, he, he didn't take my fingerprint. He, they were just laughing. He said, you can be going inside this place. So he wrote the password. That's one of the worst passwords in the world. I can't remember to go to anywhere I'm going to in my life. They'll be arresting as you come to the evidence. <laughs> Are you from there? They'll, they'll lead you out to the other place. There's a worst person in my life. They will, they will lead you across to another place. That's when you will know that, that I, I don't know what passport, what your problem is. The biggest countries in the world are giving Nigerian 10 year visa, five year visa. So, what's your problem? And they are giving in Abon, uh, listen to me, many people. So, if they didn't give you, you should ask yourself. <laughs> Don't go and say, it's because of my passport, it's because of my passport. So you should ask yourself, what did I say that I shouldn't have said? You maybe you got there, you didn't even greet the person there. You look by looking angry. But when you say, good afternoon, sir, I'm just giving you this way. Good afternoon, ma'am. And you smile. The tendency is, ah, and this person was nice. Because other people that come, that they are like, you just say, good afternoon, good afternoon, madam, good afternoon, Mr. Abu, fine. Don't say more than that, though. Don't start gisting and getting fresh. <laughs> Don't start getting fresh. Good I'm saying something like, good afternoon, sir, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh -huh. And then they do that. All right? They look at it. If you're a young man, you're going somewhere, wear a tie. Don't come like it's your city room. Are you following me, Peter? Because when I look at you and say, this person disrespects me. It's people that have traveled several times that can dress like that. I, do you get what I'm saying here? You, you are, you two are, you're on the queue with people that have been going since. They just come casually into it. Ah, you are here. <laughs> and the day they give you first one, go and give thanks. It's not your right. It's your own country is your right. Stay there. If you want to go to anybody's country, it is not your right. Are you following me here? You don't pay tax there. You didn't build that country. It's not your what? Right. Do you understand me? So be respectful. It's your country you want to come. If you don't want to, go back home. Are you from me here? Be polite. Be that. There are, there are things that people will tell you that you will, you will, you will. The first time I went to get my American visa, this was many years ago. This about twelve. When uh, when they said, well, as an adult to get a visa. See, we went there. They gave me first time two year multiplayer. So the people that were beside me, they were giving them two weeks, one one week. And the reason was I wore a suit. The, in fact, when I entered, the guy looked at me like that and looked down, looked at me. Uh, like who's this? I knew I was. Now, but this doesn't mean if you wear suit, you get it. I'm just saying. 